Before I begin, I'd like to extend to the virtual audience my sincerest welcome and gratitude. Your dedication to intellectual activity and the pursuit of greater understanding is a testament to the resolute spirit and existential weediness that characterizes human being. That last comment should not be construed as anything other than loving. You are exemplars of a species that flourishes in the harshest of conditions and as such are perfect representatives of the ethic I'm prepared to speak about today. For that and you, I'm grateful. So let's not mince words. It is deeply ironic that I'm talking to you today about the dangers of technology during times of crisis as I'm sitting at a desk in front of my computer from my home in Eastern Pennsylvania. As one is well said, one invades against technology, but one goes on using it. However, my intent is not to excoriate technology or its users for that matter, only to draw critical awareness to the problem at hand and humbly make suggestions about a possible pathway forward. A pathway that does not further denigrate our respective cultures, but is contradistinctively ennobling in essence. In his post-apocalyptic novel, Those Who Remain, D. Michael Hoff makes an important, albeit understated, observation about the effect crises can have on human psychology, when he notes that hard times create strong men. While the catastrophic effects of the recent COVID-19 outbreak are incontestable, there are arguments being made that the situation itself could be materia prima of a more grounded and authentic generation of humanity, at least in theory. In this discussion, I draw on Heidegger's early implicit ethic of finitude, as well as his later work surrounding the nature of technology, and place them in the dialogue with a global milieu contextualized by a global pandemic. I approach this discussion from two angles. In the first part of our discussion, I explicate the ethic of finitude so that it can be used as a framework to understand how global crises impact the cyclical welfare of individual human beings. And in the second, I apply the lessons given to us by the later Heidegger, specifically those oriented around the movement from uh, uh, oriented around the movement away from calculative thinking in an effort to define a loose, albeit prescriptive suggestion aimed at easing the existential strain of the situation we found ourselves in. So what precisely is the ethic of finitude? The idea itself is going to require a certain degree of unpacking, since Heidegger himself never explicitly defines it as such in being in time. If we're going to proceed forthrightly, it would do us well to examine each foundational word on its own terms. Although, seeing as ethics are discussed somewhat universally across most academic disciplines, I'm not going to belabor the issue by, by investigating what constitutes an ethical system in this lecture. All you need to know for the purposes of this discussion is that I define an ethic as a certain, defined way of acting in and toward the world, or to maintain a semblance of Heideggerian tone, how to be in our day-to-day -day comportment. This understanding takes on new significance and proximity to the, issue, to the notion of finitude, a term that might be more easily recognized within a lexical framework typically associated with the Swabian phenomenologist, temporality. For those unfamiliar with Heidegger's body of work, temporality is a unifying structure of Dasein's being. From the perspective of authentic temporality, Dasein wins itself when it commits to anticipatory resoluteness, a state construed as a striving towards self constancy and totality, even though neither condition is completely obtainable within the bounds of Dasein's finitude. In accordance with Heidegger, anticipation and resolution, resoluteness indicate a facing or conscious being towards something, specifically and ultimately towards one's almost possibility, that, uh, that being death, but also the array of possibilities to which Dasein understands itself. By describing that which anticipatory resoluteness is coming towards, the past as having been makes itself known. A confusing statement that might be better understood as such. Whatever future I choose to project myself authentically towards, within my field of possibilities, that is, will impact or change the significance of my of occurrences in my past, which in turn influence in an almost unquestionable way my predispositional understanding of my own most possibilities. While it would, would be beyond the scope of this discussion to explicate the concept of death any further than I already have, there is still one more important point that I need to address before moving forward. In describing the effect that death has on day self, the version of the self that is dissolved into the benumbing effect of Dasman, Heidegger notes a wrenching motion that pulls the self back to itself and away from the passivity of average everydayness. This wrenching, according to Heidegger, is incontrovertibly tied to the conscience that arises from Dasein's anxiousness about and subsequent resoluteness towards its own demise. Therefore, death, or more precisely the awareness of death, is that thing that narrows Dasein's horizon of possibilities and forces it to consider what it is doing in relation to its ultimate end. For a better lack of words, death's impending nature puts things in perspective for Dasein. However, the problem of perspective, at least as best as I can tell, is that in addition to whatever potentiality an individual might have, it also discloses in acute fashion the fullest extent of the, that individual's insufficiencies, which all too frequently human beings are keen to avoid at all costs. 
The evidence of this is all too apparent in recent headlines from various reporting agencies. The response to the first month of quarantine has, according to Forbes, been met with, considerable, with an a considerable increase in less than productive leisurely activities. While it would be inappropriate to delve into this report extensively, allow me to take a moment to describe a few of the article's key observations. According to Nielsen, a nearly 100-year-old marketing research and ratings firm, studies show that alcohol sales were up 55% in the week ending March 21st, $36 million worth of marijuana was sold during the month of March as well, and a prominent adult entertainment site, a site I will not dignify by naming, saw their monthly online traffic increase by nearly 12%. For me, these details make perfect sense. Similar responses to the bipolar threat of death and boredom are common in soldiers freshly deployed to the Middle East, and our responses that Heidegger would describe as inauthentic. For those who have not had the opportunity to wade through the neologistic bog that is being in time, this term might seem inherently negative, and I would like to assure those of you who harbor that kind of response that that is simply not the case. In fact, for Heidegger, inauthenticity is par for the course as far as, as, far as our day-to-day -day comportment is concerned. It does not signify any less being or any lower degree of being, says Heidegger. Rather, even in its fullest concretion, Dasein can, can be characterized by, its, by inauthenticity when busy, when excited, when interested, even when ready for enjoyment. In short, inauthenticity might be better understood as the unconscious state we experience when we are distracted, intentionally or otherwise, by the world in which we are inextricably enmeshed. However benign it might be as a naturally occurring state, distraction, specifically prolonged distraction, is precisely the point where existential suffering finds foothold in the essence of Dasein. To verify this, one need only turn to the 136 million results for what to do during quarantine produced by a simple Google search. According to the New York Times, domains such as Facebook and Netflix have seen a steep surge in usage, with the former seeing a 27% rise and the latter a 16% rise in traffic, respectively. These numbers are all the more startling when one considers the already pre-existing unhealthy obsession with media that characterized the global community prior to the rise of COVID-19. In previous research, I've discussed the issue of the internet as a digital public sphere or an evolved superego using Habermasian and Freudian frameworks, respectively. However, for the purposes of this discussion, I see no reason to deviate from Heidegger's line of thought that would qualitatively assess the internet as a manifestation of Das Mann. Again, for those unfamiliar with Heidegger, a conceptualization of Das Mann would be to consider it the one, an impersonal, external force that prescribes that one ought to do this or that in any given situation. The presence of Das Mann has a variety of implications for Dasein everyday being among one another, distantiality, averages, leveling down, publicness, the disburdening of one's being, and accommodation are all effects to be contended with whilst absorbed within the pacifying dictatorship of Das Mann. Individual Dasein who exist as they selves have their vision clouded, and according to Heidegger, are constantly going wrong in their projects as regard the genuine possibilities of being. So at this juncture, it becomes necessary to pause and consider precisely what it means to be going wrong in such a way. Although wrong is Old English in origin, it stems from the Proto-Germanic word rang, which means to bend. The Old Norse renger, meaning crooked, and to a lesser extent, the Dutch word uh, uh, rank, to sour. And ironically, the root of each of these word terms, ver, is part of a greater Indo-European language that means to turn. Those familiar with classic horror film tropes might recognize this as the linguistic prefix attached to the lycanthropically affected, otherwise known as werewolves. Therefore, it should come as no surprise when we stumble upon instances of turning in our day-to-day -day lives and immediately perceive its inherent negative quality. Anakin Skywalker turns to the dark side of the Force in the Star Wars prequel trilogy. Milk sours and turns when left unrefrigerated. And, as a popular, popularized inversion of the old idiomatic phrase goes, one wrong turn deserves another. In response to the psychopathological, psychopathological state of his patients, Maidard Boss characterizes this phenomenon as a distortion of Dasein's fundamental world openness, which contextualizes or illuminates the being of entities and encounters. This, however, seems to be an inadequate assessment of human psychology given the current situation, unless that is, we're willing to consider the possibility that a large portion of humanity in global has developed a pathological and especially pervasive form of neuroses. That may well be true in the final analysis, but for the moment, I refuse to accept that as the reality of the situation at hand. Heidegger's conceptualization of fleeing in the face of death appears to be a more apt description of the current state of things. This looking away from the end of being in the world, says Heidegger, is in itself a mode of that being towards the end, which is ecstatically futural, a bit inauthentic, and characterized by leveled off interpretations of time, punctuated by statements proclaiming that one always has time. This, as a matter of fact, could not be farther from the truth. 
While I recognize the necessity of such behavior in small doses, especially while facing the proposition of prolonged quarantine, I have no other choice but to argue that the continually turning away from our potential being no longer in the world, which none of us has yet encountered, but each is destined to fulfill in our own particular way, constitutes an abdication of a categorical existential obligation that everybody shares equally in measure, albeit individually in consequence. That being the obligation to choose authenticity or inauthenticity for ourselves. Winning one's authenticity in the Heideggerian sense requires a process of constant communication and struggle, both with the world and other entities in the world, as well as one's own possibilities. This process, it should be noted, is nothing short of heroic in its undertaking. However, given the global state of things, the possible consequence of not committing to this ethic on an individual level, namely the irreparable incongruence or total loss of self, would, not, would be nothing short of catastrophic in an existential sense. As a member of a highly social species, I feel I would be remiss in my duties if I failed to recognize the somewhat spurious nature of the problematic I've just levied at the fundamental essence of technology. There are two reasons I say this. The first being that I believe it to be the case that, the that, that the technology that we have on hand will, for all of its troubles, be viewed by future generations as an instrumental element that allowed the social fabric to remain reparably intact. Second, and more importantly, the technology is already here. We cannot, as it were, put the genie back in its bottle, and any attempt to hypothesize as to how we might do so would be little more than a fruitless thought experiment, and possibly not even that. I believe Orwell said it best when he said that the machine has got to be accepted, although it is probably better to accept it as one accepts a drug, that is, grudgingly and suspiciously. Indeed. Unfortunately, I suspect Orwell would have been critical toward her lack of judiciousness regarding the matter. In my opinion, there's little justification for the frivolous manner in which we have imbricated our existence with the digital sphere. Therefore, the closing half of this speech will shift focus from the existential threat posed by contagion and our less than admirable response to that threat toward a different modality that, although idealistic, presents itself as a way forward in a time when humanity feels lost, if only had the fortitude to seize it. So before moving forward, allow me to briefly summarize the points we've discussed thus far. The ethic of finitude describes a way of being in the world oriented by being toward death. Resolute anticipation, into anticip resolute anticipation of death brings authentic possibilities into focus and compels us to act thusly in the world, however briefly. This is not, as a friend and mentor might describe it, some mere epiphonic or visionary moment in spite of Heidegger's poetic rhetoric in the latter half of being in time. It is not some prehistorical, unmediated, and monadic form of transfigurative knowledge that emanates from within. Quite the contrary. The transfigurative truth of being towards death is precisely, distantially, that which is farthest away from us, and requires nothing short of a miraculous and constant struggle on the part of each and every individual to, to obtain. And even if we do, in our own atomized way, come to terms with the concept of our respective deaths, it is never in any way an unmediated experience. Technology, particularly social media, is useful in that it distracts us from uniquely being towards death, or more appropriately, more appropriately the struggle of remaining resolute towards death. Technology enmeshes us in Dasman more thoroughly than any distraction of modernity. The question, therefore, is how do we contend with this distraction in era when technology is all too prevalent? In order to answer that question, it would be appropriate to acknowledge maybe what one ought not to do. In this instance, over-theorizing the situation in which we happen to be situated. By pointing this out, I'm perfectly aware that I stand to contradict the message that I myself am, am attempting to transmit. However, what needs to be said needs to be said. We see over theorizing every day, both on the part of contemporary news sources, and I say that with a great trepidation, or I call them that with great trepidation, as well as on the part of everyday Joes who theorize about this or that on their respective social media pages. This shouldn't surprise us. Humans are pattern-oriented pattern creatures. Therefore, we, when we believe we see patterns in a given narrative, whatever that narrative happens to be, we tend to point it out, which in and of itself has useful qualities, provided, of course, that it moved beyond some, what it is towards something more transformative. The problem with tedious intellectualness, according to Kerouac, is that all too frequently, it tends to be the manifestation of a technocratic ideology that neither researches nor argues the knowledge it claims to be able to justify. It is an ideology that is beyond the province of experts and therefore accessible to appropriately attuned ordinary individuals. Over-theorizing fetishizes perceived knowledge, and in fetishizing, over-theorizers do nothing more than represent or explain a given situation, which itself is nothing more than the modality of distraction par excellence. But from what are we turning when we abdicate our existence to distractions such as these? 
it would be easy to assume that distraction obfuscates for the reality of death itself, which as anyone who pays attention to other people can attest to, happens not to be the case. What we turn away from when we are distracted by apathetic or over-theoretical idleness is precisely being towards death. But what does it mean to be toward any particular thing? Sartre would say that man is no other than a series of undertakings and the set of relations that constitute those undertakings. Indeed, Dasein is inextricably tied to that, that which it cares about and the associated works that accompany that concern. While Heidegger is right to ask, what is at work in these works? That is not the concern of this discussion. What we're concerned with here are the distractions we indulge in and the turning away from our works when facing the possibility of the absolute impossibility of being. Death and finitude can competently act as an existential judge by disclosing to us the fullest extent of our insufficient works. And it is precisely those insufficiencies that we turn away from, but must return to them if any modicum of authenticity is to be achieved. Which brings us to the final point of this discussion, how to think about our respective works in lieu of global catastrophe. This is where the theories of the late Heidegger become increasingly important as a precursor to the hermeneutics of the self posited by philosophers like Gadamer and Ricoeur. One cannot, after all, interpret and appropriate them oneself without having first thought about oneself. And thinking, as we have already observed, is less calculative than one might initially be inclined to consider. We've already discussed the results of calculative thinking in our previous discussion about distraction. How else should one assess apathetic or over -theor theoretical being, if not the consequence of a mode of thought resembling Bentham's utilitarianism, which never stops and never collects itself, as it, ever, as it computes ever new and promising, albeit economical, possibilities to a given problem? Although not without merit, this way of thinking is wholly inadequate for those who concern themselves with authenticity. The reason for this is in the immediacy of calculation. In the pursuit of its one-track course of ideas, calculative thinking relies on that which is closest to the thinker, causing the individual to lose track of the primordial clearing that unconceals the being of that which is. Calculative thinking, for all of its promise, is, in a very fundamental way, that which covers over the truth, in this instance, the truth about oneself. So how ought, we, how ought we think about our works? It seems, in the essence of a full examination of what it means to think about anything at all, which Heidegger himself spent so much of his later works considering, that the thread of the discussion has returned us to the ethic of finitude. This circularity cannot be vicious if the theme of our deliberation is taken to heart, because it leads directly back to where the danger is, the danger being the threat that assaults man's nature in relation to being itself, and not in accidental perils. Here, danger is not the tragedy of pandemic, but the act of turning away from that which brings us to profound self-realization, the finitude of being. This danger is compounded by the peril of returning to normalcy, which threatens us with a backslide to the familiarity of average everydayness. Even so, where there's danger, says Holderlin, there grows also that which saves, a statement that is striking in its resemblance to an axiom posited by Jung in reference to the development of a fully articulated individual, in Stoquilinus Invenitor, in filth it shall be found. Therefore, we cannot think about our lives and works in a calculative manner because calculation is the negation or turning away from that which touches us in our very nature. What is needed in order to live authentically during trying times is an affirmation. So I'm gonna close by paraphrasing from one of my earlier unpublished works because it seems especially germane to today's discussion. Johannes Climacus, the pseudonymous author of Concluding Unscientific to the Philosophical Fragments, de uh, determined that in order to be a positive force in, for the world, he must, with the same humanitarian, th uh, humanitarian enthusiasm as others, undertake to make something harder. Well, I've yet to resign myself, as Climacus did, to creating difficulties everywhere. I certainly have not done the world any favors by clarifying Heidegger's ethic of finitude. Quite the opposite, really. By recalling Heidegger's lost ethic, I am, in essence, attempting to make your life and the lives of those who will be exposed to this lecture harder by placing an ultimate ethical obligation squarely on your shoulders. If, and one must always ask themselves if in, one of the, in these circumstances, I've done my job well, then you have little choice but to take the burden of authenticity upon yourself, lest ye be found wanting existentially. For though only in those moments of fleeting authenticity, which can only be properly observed during crises, do human beings find their genuine meaning. Thank you and uh, stay safe everybody.